This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. We are the paradoxical eight. Bipedal, naked, large-brained, long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves, aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Thanks very much for having me here. So today I will tell you about the language system and some of its properties that may bear on the question on, of how this system came about. I will begin by defining the scope of my inquiry because people mean many different things by language. Um, I will then present you some evidence um, suggesting that our language system is highly specialized for language. And finally I will speculate a bit on the evolutionary origins of language. So linguistic input comes in through uh, our ears or our eyes. And once it's been analyzed perceptually, we interpret it by um, linking the incoming representation stores toward language knowledge. And this knowledge, of course, is also used for generating utterances during language production. And once we've generated um, uh, an utterance in our heads, we can send it down to our articulation system. And uh, the part that I focus on is this kind of high-level um, component of language processing. This cartoon shows you the approximate locations of the brain regions that support um, speech perception shown in yellow, uh, visual letter and word recognition in green. Um, this region is known as the visual word form area. Um, articulation in pink and high level language <coughs> processing in red. And what differentiates the high level language processing regions from the perceptual and articulation regions is that they're sensitive to the meaningfulness of the signal. So for example, the speech regions will respond just as strongly to foreign speech as they respond to meaningful speech in our own language. Um, the visual word form area responds just as much to a string of consonants as it does to real words. The articulation regions can be driven to a full extent by people producing meaningless sequences of syllables. Um, but in contrast, the high level language processing system or network, or sometimes um, I refer to it just as the language network for short, cares deeply about whether the linguistic signal is meaningful or not. In fact, um, uh, the um, easiest way to find the system in the brain is to contrast responses to meaningful language stimuli like words, phrases, or sentences, um, and some control conditions like linguistically degraded um, stimuli. And the contrast I use most frequently is between um, sentences and sequences of non-words. A key methodological innovation that laid the foundation for much of my work was the development of tools that enable us to define the regions of the language network functionally at the individual subject level using contrasts like these. And here I'm showing you um, sample language regions in uh, three individual brains. And this so-called functional localization approach um, has two advantages. One, 
It circumvents the need to average brains together, which is what's done in the common approach. And it's a very difficult thing to do because brains are quite different across people. Um, and instead, in this approach, we can just average the signals that we extract from these um, key regions of interest. And the second advantage is that it allows us to establish a cumulative research enterprise, which um, I think we all agree is important in science. Uh, because comparing results across studies and labs is quite straightforward if we're confident that we're referring to the same brain regions um, uh, across different studies. And this is just hard or impossible to do in the traditional approach, which relies on very coarse anatomical landmarks like the inferior frontal gyrus or the superior temporal sulcus, which spend many centimeters of cortex and are just not at the right level of analysis. So what drives me in my work is the desire to understand the nature of our language knowledge and the computations that mediate language comprehension and production. However, these questions are hard, um, especially given the lack of animal models for language. And so for now, I settle on more tractable questions. For example, one, what is the relationship between the language system and the rest of human cognition? Um, language didn't evolve, um, and it doesn't exist in isolation from um, other evolutionarily older systems, uh, which include the memory and attention mechanisms, the visual and the motor systems, um, the system that supports social cognition, and so on. And that means that we just can't study language as an isolated system. Um, and a lot of my research effort um, is aimed at trying to figure out how language fits with the rest of our mind and brain. And the second question delves inside the language system, asking what does it in its internal architecture look like? Um, and it encompasses questions like, what are the component parts of the language system, and what is the division of labor among them um, in space and time? And of course, both of these questions ultimately should constrain the space of possibilities for how language actually works. Um, so they place constraints on both the data structures that underlie language and the computations that are likely performed by the, by the regions of the system. And today I focus on the first of these questions. Okay, so now onto some evidence. Um, so the relationship between um, um, language and the rest of the mind and brain has been long debated. And the literature um, actually is quite abundant with claims that language makes use of the same machinery that we use for performing other cognitive tasks, including um, arithmetic processing, various kinds of executive function tasks, um, perceiving music, uh, perceiving actions, um, abstract conceptual processing, and so on. And I will argue that these claims are not supported by the evidence. Two kinds of evidence speak to the relationship between language and other cognitive systems. Um, there is brain imaging studies, brain imaging evidence, and uh, investigations of patients with brain damage. In um, fMRI studies, we do something very simple. We find our um, regions that seem to respond a lot to language, and then we ask how do they respond to other various non-linguistic tasks. And if they don't, don't show much of a response, then we can uh, conclude that uh, these regions are not engaged during those tasks. And in the patient studies, we can um, evaluate non-linguistic abilities in uh, individuals who don't have um, a functioning language system. And if they perform well, we can conclude that the language system is not necessary for performing those various non-linguistic tasks. So starting with the fMRI evidence, I will show you responses in the language regions to arithmetic, executive function tasks, and music perception um, uh, today. So here are two sample regions, a region in the inferior frontal cortex around Broca's area and a region in the posterior middle temporal gyrus. Um, but the rest of the regions of this network uh, look similar in their profiles. And uh, the, the region on the top is kind of in and around um, this region known as Broca's area, except I don't use that term because I don't think it's a very useful term. Um, in black and gray, uh, I show you the responses to the two localizer conditions, sentences and non-words. Um, and these are estimated in data that's not used to defining, to, for defining these regions. So we divide the data in half, use half of the data to define the regions, and then the other half to quantify their responses. And um, uh, I will now show you how these regions respond when people are asked to do some simple arithmetic additions, uh, perform um, a series of executive function tasks, like for example, hold a, a set of um, locations in um, spatial memory, spatial locations in, in working memory, uh, or perform um, uh, this classic flanker task, or listen to various musical stimuli. For arithmetic and various executive tasks, we included a harder and an easier um, condition uh, because we wanted to make sure that um, we can identify regions that are classically associated with performing these tasks, which is typically done by contrasting a harder and an easier condition of a, of a task. So um, I'll show you now in different colors responses to these various tasks, starting with the region um, on the lower uh, part of the screen. So we find that this region doesn't respond during arithmetic processing, doesn't respond during working memory, doesn't respond during cognitive control tasks, and doesn't respond during music perception. 
And um, quite strikingly to me at the time, uh, a very similar profile is observed around this region, which is smack in the middle of so-called Broca's area, um, which appears to be incredibly selective in its response for um, language. And note that it's not just the case that these, for example, demanding tasks fail to show a hard versus an easy difference. They respond pretty much at or below fixation baseline when people are engaged in these tests. So that, that, that basically tells you that these language regions work as much when you're doing a bunch of math in your head or hold information working memory as what you're doing when you're looking at a blank screen. So they really do not care. So of course, to interpret the lack of the response in these language regions, you want to make sure that these tasks activate the brain somewhere else. Otherwise, you may have really bad tasks um, that you don't want to use. So um, of, indeed, they do. So here, are, um, I'll show you uh, activations for the executive function tasks, but music also robustly activates the brain outside of the language system. So here are two sample regions, one in the right frontal cortex, one in the left parietal cortex. And uh, you see um, the, the, prof the profiles of response are quite different from the language regions. For each task we see um, robust responses, but also a stronger response to the harder than the easier condition across these various domains. And these regions turn out to be part of um, this bilateral frontal parietal network, which is known in the literature by many names, including the cognitive control network or the multiple demand system, the letter term advanced by uh, John Duncan, who uh, wanted to highlight um, the notion that these regions are driven by many different kinds of cognitive demands. And so these regions appear to be sensitive to effort across tasks, and their activity has been linked to a variety of goal-directed behaviors. Interestingly, if you look at the responses of these regions to our um, uh, language localizer conditions, we find exactly the opposite of what we find in the language regions. They respond less to sentences that sequences of non-words, presumably because um, processing sentences requires less effort. Um, but clearly, this highlights, again, that the language and the cognitive control system are clearly uh, functionally distinct. Moreover, damage to the regions of the multiple demand network has been shown to lead to decreases in uh, fluid intelligence. So Alex Wilgar and colleagues have reported a strong relationship between the amount of tissue loss in frontal and parietal cortices and a measure of IQ. And this is not true for tissue loss in the temporal lobes. Um, and it's quite striking. You can actually calculate for you know, this many cubic centimeters of loss in the MD system, you lose so many IQ points. Um, it's a strong, clear relationship. So this system is clearly an important part of the cognitive um, arsenal of humans because the ability to think flexibly and abstractly and to solve new problems are exactly, um, uh, you know, th these are the kinds of abilities that um, IQ tasks aim to measure are considered kind of one of the hallmarks of uh, human cognition. Okay, so as I mentioned, the complementary approach for addressing questions um, about language specificity and relationship to other mental functions is to examine cognitive abilities in individuals who lack a properly functioning language system. And most telling are cases of global aphasia. So this is a severe disorder which affects pretty much the entire frontotemporal language system, typically due to a large stroke in the um, middle cerebral artery, um, and lead to profound deficits in comprehension and production. And uh, Rosemary Varley at UCL has been studying this population for a few years now. And with her colleagues, she has shown um, uh, that actually um, these patients seem to have preserved um, abilities across many, many domains. So she showed that they have intact arithmetic abilities, they can reason causally, um, they have good nonverbal social skills, they can navigate in the world, they can perceive music, and so on and so forth. And of course, these findings are then consistent with the kind of picture that um, emerges in our work um, in fMRI. Let's consider another important non-linguistic um, capacity, which a lot of people often um, bring up um, when I tell them about this work. How about the ability to extract meaning from non-linguistic stimuli? Right, so given that um, our language regions are so sensitive to meaning, we can ask how much of that response is due to the activation of some kind of abstract conceptual representation that language may elicit, rather than something more language specific, um, uh, semantic representation um, type. type. So um, to, to ask these questions, we can look at how language regions respond to nonverbal meaningful representations. In one study, we had people um, uh, look at events like this, um, or the sentence level descriptions of them. And and either um, we had them do um, kind of a high level semantic um, judgment task, like decide whether the event is plausible, or do a very demanding perceptual control task. And basically what you find, um, here's again the uh, gray and black and gray are responses to the localizer conditions. So in red, um, as you would expect, you find strong responses to the, sen to the condition where people see sentences and make semantic judgments on them. Um, and so what happens when people um, make semantic judgments on pictures? 
we find that some regions don't care at all about those conditions, and other regions um, show uh, reliable responses, but they're much weaker than those elicited by the meaningful um, sentence condition. So could it be that some of our language regions are actually abstract semantic regions? Perhaps, but for now keep in mind that the response um, uh, to the sentence meaning condition is twice stronger, um, and uh, it is also possible that participants may be activating linguistic representations to some extent when they encounter meaningful visual stimuli. So to answer this question more definitively, we're turning to uh, the patient evidence again. If parts of the language system are critical for processing meaning in non-linguistic representations, then um, aphasic individuals should have some difficulties with nonverbal semantics. First, I want to share a quote with you um, from Tom Lobock, a, a former uh, art critic at the, at the, independ at the Independent, um, who developed um, a tumor in the left temporal lobe, which eventually um, killed him. And as the tumor progressed and he was losing his linguistic abilities, he was documenting his impressions of what it feels like to, be, to lose the, um, the capacity to express yourself using verbal means. So he wrote, my language to describe things in the world is very small, limited. My thoughts when I look at the world are vast, limitless, and normal, same as they ever were. My experience of the world is not made less but by lack of language, but is essentially unchanged. And I think this quote quite powerfully highlights the separability of language and thought. So in um, work that I'm currently um, collaborating on with Rosemary Varley and uh, Nancy Kemwisher, we are evaluating the global aphasics performance on a wide range of um, uh, tasks requiring you to process meaning in uh, nonverbal stimuli. So for example, can they distinguish between real objects and novel objects that are matched for low level visual properties? Can they make plausibility judgments for um, uh, visual events? And what about events where plausibility is conveyed simply uh, by the pr uh, prototypicality of the roles. So you can't do this task by simply inferring that a watering can doesn't appear next to an egg very frequently, right? And it seems like the data so far are suggesting that they indeed seem fine um, uh, on all of these tasks. And they laugh just like we do when we see these pictures because they're sometimes a little funny. So they seem to um, uh, process these just fine. So this suggests to me that um, these kinds of tasks can be performed without a functioning language system. Um, and so even if our language system stores some abstract conceptual knowledge in some parts of it, it tells me at least that that code must live somewhere else as well. So even if we lose our linguistic way to encode this information, we can have access to it elsewhere. So to conclude this part, um, fMRI and patient studies converge in suggesting that the frontotemporal language system is not engaged in and is not needed for um, non-linguistic cognition. Um, instead, it appears that these regions are highly specialized for interpreting um, uh, and generating linguistic signals. So just um, a couple minutes on uh, what this means. So given this highly selective response to language stimuli that we observe, can we make some guesses already about what these regions actually do? I think so. Um, I think a plausible hypothesis is that this network houses our linguistic knowledge, including our knowledge of the sounds of the language, the words, the constraints on how sounds and words can combine with one another. And then essentially, the process of language interpretation is finding matches between the pieces of the input that are getting into our language system and our previously stored representations. Um, and language production is just selecting the relevant subset of the representations to then convey um, um, to our communication partner. And uh, this way, and, and the form that this knowledge takes is a huge question um, in linguistic psychology and neuroscience. So one result I don't have time to discuss is that contra some claims, it doesn't seem to be the case that syntactic processing is localized to a particular part of this language system. It seems it's widely distributed across. And anywhere throughout the system, you find sensitivity to both word level meanings and compositional aspects of language, which is much in line with all current linguistic theorizing, which doesn't draw a short, sharp boundary between the lexicon and grammar. So this way of thinking about the language system as a store of our language knowledge makes it pretty clear that the system is probably not innate. Um, in fact, it must arise via experience with language as we accumulate this language store. It's also presumably dynamic, changing all the time as we get more and more linguistic input through our lifetimes. And I assume that our language knowledge is plausibly acquired with uh, domain general statistical learning mechanisms, just like much um, uh, other knowledge. So what changed? Um, uh, in our brains that allowed for the emergence of this system. So one thing that um, 
One thing that changed is that our association cortices is expanded. So these are regions that are not sensory and motor regions and include frontal, temporal, and parietal regions. Okay, so this people have um, noted for a long time. Um, and I think um, I'm kind of in the camp of people who think that our brains are not categorically different in any way. They're just scale, scaled up versions of other primate brains. There's, I think there's quite good evidence for that. And uh, so how does the system emerge? So I think one thing that was different between us and uh, chimps is that um, there is a protracted course to the brain development in humans. So between birth and adulthood, our brains increase threefold compared to just twofold in chimps. It's a big difference. Um, and basically, this just makes us exceptionally um, susceptible to environmental influences. And we can soak stuff up from the environment very, very easily. So as our brains grow, you know, we make more glial cells. We make more synapses. Our axons continue to grow and become myelinated. And, uh, it's basically tissue that's ready to soak up the regularity that we see in the world. And of course, it comes at a cost. That's why we'll have totally useless babies that can't do anything. But uh, <laughs> apparently, somehow, it was worse. Uh, the trade-offs were worse, uh, worth it. Um, OK, so the conclusions is you know, we have this system. It's highly selective in its responses. It presumably emerges over the course of our development. And what enabled it is probably some combination of the expansion of these association cortices where we can store vast amounts of symbolic information and this protracted brain development, which makes us great learners early on. Okay. Thank you. So um, I want to start this story actually in the 1800s. So that in 1800, um, a young physician named Etard decided to take the, on the task of teaching a young boy French. Turns out that this young boy, they think, was between 10 and 12 years old. Um, he had no language. And he'd been discovered running around in the, in the woods naked um, and unable to communicate. Itzhard thought that this was a very important task because he thought that civilization was based on the ability to emphasize, empathize and also on language. So he tried valiantly for two years to teach this young boy named Victor. He named him Victor because over this two-year time span, the only language that or sounds that this young boy could make was the French er, which sounds like Victor, hence he had his name. But after two years, Victor was unable to um, speak any French and comprehended very little French and primarily communicated with objects. And then Itard wrote this up after two years. He wrote up his uh, findings and he said that he thought that a major reason why Victor didn't learn French was because he was simply too old. But of course, this was the 1800s and he didn't speculate as to what it was about being 10 years old with no language that would prevent you from learning language if you had a daily tutor trying to teach you French. There's an enormous amount of irony in this particular story because Etard was the house physician for the first school for the deaf in the entire world. And here we have a picture of it. The first school for the deaf was begun in 1760 in Paris. And at the time that Etard was teaching um, Victor, he was at the school with all of these children who use sign language and all of these teachers who use sign language. Nonetheless, it never occurred to him to try to teach Victor sign language. But um, we can't blame him because in the 1800s, sign language was not considered to be a language. And in fact, that particular discovery and realization wouldn't happen for another century and a half. And so um, we can imagine why he didn't teach uh, Victor sign language. But the question is, could Victor have actually learned sign language if Etard had tried to teach it to him? Um, and so I'm going to try to answer that question today through a series of studies. But before I talk about our studies, I want to talk about something that all of the speakers who have preceded me have talked about, which is that one thing that's a, the defining characteristic of language is that it's highly structured. And it's highly structured at all of these multiple levels, so that speech sounds make up words, words make up, with their, make up words and phonemes, um, and these words are strung together in sentences with syntax. And this specific syntax helps us understand and produce very specific kinds of meanings. Now, and one aspect of, of uh, this language structure is that humans have evolved to the point where children learn this structure naturally. Nobody has to teach them. 
Nobody has to have a tutor to sit with them for two years to teach them the structure of French or the structure of English or the structure of ASL. Simply by being around people who use a language, young children naturally acquire all of this multi-leveled and complicated structure. That is to say, all children do this if, in fact, they can access the language around them. If they have normal hearing, they're born with normal hearing, they hear people talk, and before you know it, they're talking themselves. But if children are born profoundly deaf, they cannot hear the speech around them. And we know that lip reading is insufficient to learn language because most of the speech sounds are invisible. What happens to these children? If there's no sign language in the environment, they can't learn a visual form of language either. So it happens that there are large numbers of children who actually are like Victor in the sense that they grow up without language, without learning a language, but they are like Victor, they are unlike Victor in that they were running around in the woods nude and uh, having a very harsh life. So how does the lack of language and childhood affect the ability to learn language, or does it affect the ability to learn language? And this has been the focus of uh, studies that we have been doing um, for many years in our laboratory. Because we're using deaf children and sign language as a means to model language acquisition and its effect on the brain, I think it's appropriate that um, I talk a little bit about the kinds of stimuli we do and about American Sign Language. So, First of all, you should know that American Sign Language, unlike many of the sign languages that have been discussed up to this point, is a very sophisticated language. It's evolved clearly over 200 years. You might even say that American Sign Language evolved with um, the development of the United States of America and spread as a civilization went across, as white man went across um, the continent. So the uh, American Sign Language has a phonological system, a morphological system, syntax, um, and so forth. So for those of you who don't know sign, I know there are many people here who do know sign, I want to show you what some of this structure looks like. So I'm going to play you two videotapes. And for those of you who don't know sign, I would like you to guess which one is syntactically structured. And for those of you who do know sign, Maybe you could keep the answer to yourselves. <laughs> That's one. Here's two. So how many think two? How many think one? OK. For those of you who think two, I captioned this. So this is really. Com, dirt, boom, blip, mackers, <laughs> gram kicks. <laughs> number, um, number one is a fully formed sentence with a subordinate clause. The reason I'm showing you these two sentences is, for those of you who don't know the language, you can't perceive or parse this particular structure. This is what knowing a language is about. For those of you who know ASL and who know this language, you know that the second example had all of these signs which were non-signs, possible signs, but really just uh, non-signs. This is part of what knowing language is about. How do people learn this particular structure? And the question that we're interested in is, how does being a young child help people learn this particular structure? So, we did a series of experiments. Um, when we started this work, it wasn't even clear that age would make a difference in sign language acquisition. Sign language is gestural. Sign language is mimetic. Maybe anybody can learn sign language at any time in their lives. So in one experiment, what we did is we recruited a number of people. This is in Canada. Who, used, who were born deaf and who used ASL. And we asked them. We created an experiment where we had a set of um, sentences that varied in complexity, and we showed them these ASL sentences, and we asked them simply to point to a picture that reflected the meaning of the sentence that they saw. And here, when we were quite struck by the, our findings, what you see here is that deaf people who learned ASL from birth from their parents performed very, very well on this task. In contrast to deaf people who were adults who had been signing for over 20 years performed at chance. So they had great difficulty understanding some of these basic sentences in ASL. 
So this suggests that there are age of acquisition effects for sign as there are for spoken language. Everybody sort of, the, the word on the street is it's much harder to learn a language if you're an adult than you're a child. But what if it's something deeper than this? What if there's something about learning a language in childhood that sets up the ability to learn language, that creates the ability to learn language? And so we did another experiment, also in Canada, but we decided to, in order to test this particular hypothesis, we should switch languages. So we're no longer testing a, um, ASL here. What we're testing here is English. We devised an experiment in English where we had a set of sentences and some of them were ungrammatical and some of them were um, grammatical. This is a common kind of task that psycholinguists use. And notice here that the people who were born profoundly deaf and for whom ASL was a first language are near native in English. So this is a second language. So learning a language early, even though it's in sign, helps people learn a second language. And notice also that they performed, their performance was indistinguishable from normally hearing people who had learned other languages at birth, German, Urdu, Spanish, and French. So that there's, it seems to be that there's something about learning a language early in life, regardless of whether it's a sign language or a spoken language, that actually helps people learn more language. It's not simply learning language when one is little. But as also part of this experiment, we tested a group of individuals who'd been signing for 20 years and had gone through the educational system in Canada who were born deaf. And on this task, they performed at chance. On a grammaticality judgment task, it's either yes or no, so it's a chance. So we see that individuals who are deprived of language, who aren't able to learn language at a young age, perform poorly on the, their primary language, sign language, and they perform very poorly on a second language, which is ASL, and we see the reverse. So there's something really special going on here about learning language at an early age. And what might this be? And might it be in the brain? So in a sec another set of studies, what we did is um, take these, this population that we had been looking at, and we decided to neuroimage their language processing to see whether this might give us some clues as to differences between first and second language learners and people who had language and people who did not have language. So in this study, also done at Canada, in Canada with colleagues at the Montreal Neurological Institute, we did MRI or fMRI, um, and maybe many of you have had MRIs, and um, we showed the subjects sentences like the sentences that you saw, and we asked them to make grammatical judgment, um, judgments on these sentences. And we tested 22 people. They were all born profoundly deaf. They all used American Sign Language as a primary language. They had all gone through the educational system. But they ranged in the age at which they were first able to acquire language. This is all the way from birth up to age 14. So if the age at which you learn your first language doesn't make a difference, then we should expect the neural processing patterns of all of these individuals to be similar. If age of acquisition makes a difference, we should see different patterns in the brain. And in fact, this is what we have. This is what we found um, when we did the analysis. We found that there were seven regions in the brain, primarily in the left hemisphere. Um, and as you know now, the left hemisphere has um, areas that are responsible for language. And one effect that we found was that in the language regions of the left hemisphere. The earlier the person learned their first language, the more activation we saw in the language hemisphere. However, the older the person was, when they learned their first language, the less activation we got in the, the language areas of the brain. So if there's less activation, is there something else going on here? And we actually found a second effect, which we were not expecting at all, which is in the um, back part of the brain, the posterior part of the brain, and the visual processing, which is, and this particular effect was that the, old, the longer the person matured, the older the, um, without language, the older they were when they learned language, we found greater activation, more neural resources being uh, uh, devoted to visual processing. So we see that here in this group of deaf signers, we have two complementary reciprocal effects of when a child learns his or her, when an individual learns their first language, and what the brain seems to be doing in terms of processing that language. So that for people who learned language early in life, almost all of their neural resources are devoted to processing the meaning and structure of that language. For people who learn their first language later in life, 
more neural resources are devoted to just trying perhaps to figure out what the signal was. Was it this a word? Was it glom or was it gleam? Um, and uh, so we have this reciprocal relationship between perceptual processing and language processing. This particular pattern is not unique to deaf signers. There's work by Tim Brown and um, uh, Schlegger that show that younger children often have more posterior activation than older children. And there are also some clinical populations, such as autistic individuals, particularly those who have low, whose language skills are not well developed, will often show more processing in the occipital lobe. So this is not a pattern that is unique to deafness. So then the next question we had is whether, in fact, is how does language develop when an individual first starts to learn it when they're much older, for example, when they are a teen? And we have been um, very fortunate to have followed five or six children um, in our laboratory who had no language until they were 13 to 14 years of age for a variety of reasons. Um, two of these children are from the United States. Um, these other children are from other countries. Um, and actually, this particular circumstance, while we might think of it as being very rare, is actually very common, and particularly in underdeveloped countries. Um, and so the way in which we have observed or analyzed their language acquisition is to use uh, normal procedures that people use to study children's language acquisition. We get a lot of spontaneous data from them, and we analyze it. And so the one question we had is, if you're 13 years old and you don't have a language system, Will you develop language like a baby, or will you do something else? Because you have a developed cognitive system where you jump in the middle of the task, um, and how will this progress? To answer this question, we need to look a little bit at how um, we, um, normally hearing children or uh, deaf or hearing children develop language when they are, are exposed to it as a young age. A major hallmark children's language acquisition is that they very quickly as they are acquiring the gram grammar of their language, their sentences get longer and longer. And the reasons their sentences get longer and longer is because they're learning all of these, uh, uh, the morphology, the syntax, and as they say ideas, they're, uh, they, as they're expressing their ideas, they're better able to um, uh, use grammar to express them. And so these data show the average length of children's expressions. Two of these children are normally hearing and acquiring English, and um, two of these children are acquiring ASL. So um, we see that, in fact, the teens that we have been following show no increase in their language. They're able to learn language and put words together, but in fact, we don't see an increase in their grammar. In the last study, we wanted to neuroimage these children. We wanted to see what are their brains doing with um, the language that they have, and so we used a magno, we used MEG, magnetoencephalography, which is a different technique, which is complementary to the fMRI. And uh, what we did for this is we studied their vocabulary, and we made stimuli that we knew that they knew, the words that were in their vocabulary, and it looked something like this. In, in the first instance, the picture matched the sign. In the second instance, it didn't. And when that happens, the brain goes, uh-oh, and you get this uh, N400 response. And that's what we we're localizing in the brain for these children. And because we're using vocabulary that, the, um, that they have, we know that they knew these words. We asked them to press buttons and while they were doing this task, and we knew that they were accurate. We didn't only test these children. We also tested control groups. And so some of these control groups are deaf, some are hearing, some are first language learners, and some are second language learners. The first panel shows the response of a group of normally hearing adults doing this task while looking at pictures and listening to words. And this is data um, that, from, that Katie Travis used also to look at uh, young children's development, um, neuro, neural development. The second panel, these are deaf adults who learned ASL from birth. And you can see that their processing is very much like the um, hearing adults who are speaking English, um, primarily left hemisphere in the language areas with some support or help from the right hemisphere, and actually these patterns are indistinguishable. Both the hearing adults and the deaf adults learned language from birth, even though it was in a different form. What's this last panel? These are college students, they're normally hearing. Uh, they have been learning sign for about three years, which is about the same amount of time that our cases were learning language, so that we see that, for, that um, responding on this task in, in speech 
and in ASL, whether it's a first language or a second language, so long as the subject had language from birth, looks fairly similar. What about the cases? We were able to neuroimage two cases. And you can see that their neural processing patterns are quite different. Um, and they look neither like second language learners, nor do they look like deaf adults. Um, these children have been signing for um, three years. Um, and they had no language before they started to learn how to sign. You can see primarily that there's a, a huge response in the right hemisphere, in the occipital and parietal areas. One of the subjects also shows some, some response in the language areas. But we can see that even though they're acquiring language, they're doing it in a very different way, and their brains are responding very differently. So we see that, in fact, that there are huge effects of language environment on both the development of language, but also how the brain processes language. So we see that it seems to be that the human language capacity, both understanding language and expressing language, but also the brain's ability to process language is very dependent upon the baby's brain being exposed to or immersed in language from birth. And it's through this. Um, analyzing language and, and working on the data that it's being fed that, in fact, I think that the neural networks of language are being uh, created. So language is a skill that is not innate, but emerges from the interaction of the child with the environment through linguistic communication. And that was probably the answer that Etard was looking for and might be the reason why Victor did not acquire language. Thank you. Okay, so I wanted to first thank the uh, organizers really for this uh, kind invitation to um, join this cast of stellar uh, thinkers about the biology and behavior of language. And um, I actually want to switch the title a little bit to something more specific. I want to talk to uh, you about uh, organization, in particular a kind of organization that I refer to as a taxonomy. And um, the organization that I'm uh, actually really referring to is the organization of sound, in particular speech sounds, and how those are actually processed in a very important part of the brain called uh, the superior temporal gyrus, uh, also known as Wernicke's area. Um, the main focus of my lab is actually to understand the basic transformation that occurs when you have an acoustic stimulus and how it becomes transformed into phonetic units. In other words, basically, how do we go from the physical stimulus that enters our ears into one that's essentially a mental construct, one that's a linguistic one? And to basically ask the simple question, what is the structure of that kind of information as it's processed in the brain? Now, um, this actually turns out to be a very um, complex problem because it's one that actually arises from many levels of computation that occur in the ascending auditory system. As sounds actually come through the ears, they go up through at least seven different uh, synaptic connections across many different parts of the brain, even bilaterally, uh, to where they're actually processed in the non-primary auditory cortex in the superior temporal gyrus. And what we know about this area from animal studies in non-human primates, for example, is that this is an area that no longer is tuned to basic low-level sound features like pure tones, uh, pure frequencies, but in one that is actually tuned to very broad, complex sounds. Uh, there have been very nice uh, work in fMRI that's actually demonstrated that this area is far more selective to complex sounds like speech over uh, non-speech sounds. So the basic question is not really about where is this processing going on. The question is how. OK, what is the structure of information in this transformation that's going on? And in particular, what kind of linkages can we make between that physical stimulus and the internal one, which is a phonetic one? For me, I think it's really important to acknowledge some really important fundamental contributions that occur um, that give us some insight and put them in uh, a, a very important perspective. For me, I think one of the most important pieces of work that led to this uh, work that I'm about to describe from our lab was actually 25 years ago, uh, using an approach that's actually far more complicated and difficult to achieve than what we do in our own work. Uh, this is using 
uh, single unit, single neuron recordings that were recorded from patients that were undergoing neurosurgical uh, procedures for their clinical routine care. And this very extremely rare but precious opportunity to actually record from certain brain areas while someone is actually recording, uh, listening to speech. And these are from my close colleague and mentor, uh, Dr. Ojeman, who's in, in the audience today. But why I think it's so important to acknowledge this work is a lot of the clues about what I'm about to describe were actually seen 25 years ago. And this figure that's extracted from that paper where they actually showed and could record from single brain cells called neurons in the superior temporal gyrus that they were, they were active and corresponding to very specific sounds. But if you actually look at where those sounds are, there's, um, they're not exactly corresponding to the same exact, let's say, phonemes or the same exact sounds. But in fact, they are corresponding to a class of sounds. This was an observation that was made in this paper. And they thought that, well, perhaps this is uh, some mention of a phonetic category representation there. But it wasn't that clear, actually. And there were a lot of other uh, really important observations that were made in that paper. Now, from a linguistic perspective, um, you know, in thinking about how behaviorally we organize this information in the brain, there's actually a wonderful way to approach it. It's not perfect, but a very wonderful way to think about how languages across the world actually share a, a similar and shared inventory of speech sounds. Not all completely the same. Each language has a different number, and, but they highly overlap. And the reason why they overlap is they, because they are produced by the same vocal tract. And this is essentially like a periodic table of sound elements for human language and speech. And so um, this table actually has two really important dimensions. The horizontal dimension is actually one that we call the place of articulation. It's referencing where in the vocal tract these sounds are made. For example, bilabial sounds, the P and the B, require you to actually have a transient occlusion at the lips, but you cannot make those sounds without that particular uh, articulatory movement. Whereas uh, some of the other sounds like a duh or a D or a T, a duh, a T, a duh, we call alveolar because the front of the tongue tip is actually placed against the teeth. And so these are actually referencing where occlusions are occurring in the vocal tract when we speak, and those actually correlate necessarily to very specific acoustic um, signatures. The other dimension is what we call the manner of articulation. And so the manner of articulation is actually telling you a little bit more about the, not so much where, but how in the vocal tract the constrictions are made in order to produce those sounds. We have certain ones like plosives where you have complete closure of the vocal tract uh, and then transient release. Uh, other sounds where you have near complete, like a fricative, like sh, z, um, those sounds that we call fricative. And um, if you actually look at uh, vowel, vowels, they actually have a similar uh, structural organization. There actually is something that actually references where in the vocal tract, either the front, middle, or back, or uh, the degree of open and closure. So for both consonants and vowels, there actually is a structure that we know about linguistically and phonologically about uh, how these things are, are organized. I think the thing that, that interests me is that, like I referenced before, that this is something like a periodic table, is that there is something fundamental about these units to our ability to uh, perceive speech. And these phonological representations are not necessarily the ones that we think of as these letters that we call phonemes, but actually uh, groups of phonemes that share uh, something in common, what we call features. And these, these are the members of small categories which combine to form the speech sounds of human language. This became very attractive to me as, as, as a model of something to look for in the brain because um, of essentially why it could be so important is that languages actually do not vary without limit, but they actually reflect some single or limited general pattern which is actually rooted in both the physical and cognitive capacities of the human brain and I would add the vocal tract. And this is a very, not a new kind of thinking, but it's one that has not been clearly elucidated uh, in terms of its biological mechanisms. So in order for us to get this information, um, it requires a very special opportunity, the one where we can actually record directly from the brain. And in many ways, this is actually a lot more coarse than the kind of recordings that were 
you know, done almost 25 years ago. These are ones from electrode uh, sensors that are placed on the brain in order to localize seizures in patients that have epilepsy. In the seven to 10 days that they are usually waiting to be localized, we have a very, again, precious opportunity to actually have some of the participant, the patient volunteers, listen to natural continuous speech as a, and look at those neural responses on these electrode recordings to see how information is distributed in the superior temporal gyrus when they're listening to these sounds. This gives you a sense of, of, of actually what that neural activity pattern looks like. We're going to go to green five now. We're going to slow down that sentence a lot here. Ready, tiger, go to green five now. So you can see that the information is being processed in a very precise both spatial and temporal manner in the brain. And this is exactly the reason why this kind of information has been elusive, because we do not currently have a method that actually has both spatial and temporal resolution, and at the same time covers all of these, these areas simultaneously. And so uh, it's, again, in the context of these uh, rare opportunities with uh, human patient volunteers that we can conduct this kind of research. So the natural question is, of course, now that I've shown you that we can actually see a pattern in the brain, both that's temporally and uh, spatially specific, what actually happens when we try to deconstruct some of those uh, sound patterns uh, from the brain? And this just gives you an example, again, in the superior temporal gyrus, where those uh, sounds are activating the brain. And uh, an example of the spectrogram for a given sentence, and in this case, it's in what eyes they were. And the last part of that figure basically shows you that pattern across different electrodes. It's not all happening in the same particular way. You have very specific evoked responses that actually occur at different parts of the superior temporal gyrus. And I want to show you what happens when you look at just one of those electrodes. And if you look at the neural response of that one particular electrode that's labeled E1, and you organize the neural response by different phonemes, okay, you can actually see, again, on the vertical axis, starting with da, ba, ga, pa, ta, ka, you can see that this electrode, those hundreds of or thousands of neurons that are under this electrode are very selectively responsive to this set of sounds that we call plosives. It's not one phoneme, but a category. And they share this feature that we actually know linguistically to be called plosive. I can show you a series of other electrodes. Uh, electrode 2 has a very different kind of sensitivity. It's showing you that it really likes those sounds, sh, za, sa, fa. This is an electrode that is, again, not tuned to one phoneme, but actually tuned to the category of sibilant fricatives in linguistic jargon. We have another electrode, E3, that is selective to low back vowels, these ah-based ones. Uh, another one that is a little bit more selective to uh, high-fronted vowels, E. And even uh, another electrode, E5, that is corresponding to uh, nasal sounds. So this is a very low-level description, but is actually the first time we've ever seen in this kind of principled way, <laughs> obtained through very precise spatial and temporal uh, recordings, the ability to resolve phonetic feature selectivity at single electrodes in the human brain. Now, this is not enough. We need to really uh, address this issue of structure. Uh, that's one of the themes here. And are all of these things just equally distributed as features? In the original thinking about these things, you could have a binary list of, of features. And it turns out that features in and of themselves actually have structure and have relationships with one another. And so what we did in order to look at that structure in the brain, we looked at hundreds of electrodes that were recorded over several, uh, over a dozen patients. And each one of those columns actually corresponds to one electrode in one particular uh, superior temporal gyrus uh, in, in someone's brain. And like I just showed you before, uh, the, um, the vertical axis is actually how they're organized by different phonemes. And what we did here was we used a statistical method called hierarchical clustering. And what hierarchical clustering is, is used for is finding the patterns in this data. 
And what the hierarchical clustering showed us and sorted this data was that, in fact, there is indeed structure in the brain's responses to human speech sounds. And it looks like this. So we've organized the hierarchical clustering as a function of a single electrodes, again, a single column's selectivity to different phonemes. But we've also organized this uh, clustering uh, as a population response across all of the electrodes um, and looking at that selectivity uh, for different phonemes. So you have two different axes that we're actually looking at the brain's large distributed response to speech sounds. And we're using this method, which is what we call unsupervised, meaning we're not telling it any linguistic information or we're not organizing the data. We're just saying, tell us how the brain is organizing this information. And what we see from this is that when we actually look at where this information is being organized, one of the biggest divisions between different parts of the different kinds of selectivity in the brain are what we would call the difference between consonants and vowels, or really actually between obstruence and, um, and uh, continuance um, in linguistic jargon. But within those different categories, you actually have subclassification. So within the consonants, you actually have a subdivision between plosives and fricatives. And between the sonorants, you actually have referencing for different positions of the tongue, low back, low front, high front, different classes of vowels, and in fact, nasal. So basically, this is telling you that feature selectivity in the brain is actually hierarchically structured. The second thing is that when instead of using phonemes in order to organize the responses, we actually use uh, features. So uh, as an example, that term dorsal actually refers to uh, the tongue position when it's uh, fairly back, uh, like for ga, ka sounds. Um, and you can see that when we organize things by features, you have a much cleaner delineation. Uh, the electrode responses seem to be much more tuned to phonetic features shown below as they are compared to when you plot them as <coughs> phonemes. OK, so this essentially disproves any idea that there is individual phoneme representation in the brain, at least not one that's locally encoded, but tells you that the brain is organized by its sensitivity to phonetic features. Now, relating it to a phonetic feature is the first step. And it's one that's really important because it's referencing the one that we, we know about from linguistics and the one that we know behaviorally. But how do we connect this to the physical stimulus that's actually coming through our ears? And that's where we have to make a linkage to actually something about the sound properties. Are these things truly abstract features that are being picked up by the brain? Or actually, are they referencing specific sound properties? And basically, the, the answer is the latter, is that what we're actually seeing is sensitivity to particular spectrotemporal features. When we, in the top row, I am showing you basically, when we look at the average tuning curves, the frequency versus time tuning curves for each one of those different classifications uh, for plosive fricatives, they're very similar to the acoustic structure when you average those particular phonemes in the brain. So what this means is the tuning that we're seeing that's corresponding to phonetic features is in fact one that is tuned to high order acoustic spectrotemporal ones. The brain is selecting specific kind of acoustic information and converting it into a f what we perceive as phonetic. In the interest of time, I'm going to sort of skip more in depth information about you know, vowels and, and plosives and how those are specifically encoded. But in summary, what we found is that there's actually a multidimensional feature space actually for speech sounds in the human uh, superior temporal gyrus. And that, there, uh, that this feature space is organized uh, in a way that actually shows hierarchical structure. And that um, the hierarchical structure is very, very strongly driven by the brain's, and in particular, this auditory cortex sensitivity to acoustic differences, which are most signified actually in the manner of articulation uh, distinctions linguistically. And what's interesting about this is it actually does correlate quite well with uh, some known perceptual uh, behavior. And so um, I would like to uh, con conclude there and acknowledge uh, some of the, the really important people from my lab, uh, postdoctoral fellow Nima Mascarani, who did most of this work with one of our graduate students, uh, Connie Chung. Thank you.